one I went to recently uh, was um, the other one, uh, God is Not Dead. I went to see that, and, and I have to say, I liked, I liked a lot of it, uh, and I, I liked, for one thing, I liked the fact that they poked holes in the, the preposterous and implausible notions that modern science promotes as to the origins of the universe and uh, origin of life. I like that about it. What, what, the, what it is, in case you don't know, uh, if you don't know what it is, it's a, it's a fictionalized story, or a fictional story of a, uh, the premise is a, uh, a college student, first semester freshman, takes a philosophy class because he needs it for his schedule. And the professor of the philosophy class is an atheist, and so he asks all the students at the beginning of the class to sign a declaration saying that God is dead. And so he can just not have to prove that point and just move on. And he's, you know, the idea is, well, in this modern world, surely there's nobody that really believes in God. So all the students are all signing this piece of paper that says God is dead, and they sign their name to it, except this one student in the, in the story, uh, the one who the story is about, uh, he refuses to sign it. And so the professor uh, sees that he didn't sign the paper, and he says, why didn't you sign the paper? And he says, well, because I'm a Christian. And then, of course, creates this conflict with his professor. So the professor being all full of himself and uh, thinking that he's got all the answers, he says, okay, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you three class periods to take the last part of the class to see if you can prove your point. If you can prove that God is not dead, then I'll uh, let you pass the course. Otherwise, you're going to flunk the course. And so that's the premise. That's the conflict in the movie. And so the movie is um, then about the student, uh, how he presents his uh, proofs uh, that, uh, that God is not dead. And I liked, uh, I liked the, uh, the, you know, of course, this is a fictional story, so the, the student is the uh, representative of Christianity. He, he's presenting the, what the mo movie producers view as Christianity, and the atheist is the secular, you know, he represents the secular world, and he's the, you know, the non-believing atheist. And it was an interesting uh, movie, uh, and, and again, I liked best the, the way they, uh, they, they made a good uh, argument against the, you know, when, when scientists, uh, and I put that in quotation marks, uh, or authority figures of any kind, when they talk about and, and Nova specials, and then when they talk about life beginning out of a you know, little pool of slime and, and then evolving to the modern state of things, I mean, they can just say that, and if nobody challenges it, if you don't think about it, uh, it just passes right on, but if you stop and think about it, or the, uh, the Big Bang, that everything, uh, you know, originated um, out of just some chaotic explosion, that you can look around and see an ordered universe that assembled itself all on its own uh, through a, a chaotic explosion. It's a far-fetched and preposterous idea, and I like the fact that they pointed that out. And those ideas only work if you don't think about them. <laughs> those things. You know, and if you stop and think about it, if you consider for a moment, you're left with no other alternative. If, you know, if the best they can offer is a big explosion, then this whole ordered, rational universe that we can draw scientific, you know, mathematic, this universe functions by mathematical laws. You know, it's not uh, just random chaos uh, in gases and things like that. You know, there is a, an order, an observable order to the universe. And uh, if you examine the, their, their notions, they're pretty far-fetched. but. Um, I like that, but here's, here's what I didn't like, or I, I guess here's what I want to make a little critique about. Um, the movie presents, I think, I, I guess, mainstream Christianity the way uh, that they view it to be. I think it was made by Christians, by the way. And in one sense, the atheist and the Christians uh, in, in this movie share a common assumption, and that is that, that God controls everything that happens. In the movie, there's a pre the pastor, and he's trying to go on vacation, and his car won't start. So he gets a rental car, and then it won't start. So he gets another rental car, and it won't start. And as it turns out, somebody wants to come and counsel with him. And so what they're suggesting is God wouldn't let his car start, so that he would just be there, you know. And the, uh, another, uh, at one point, the atheist uh, professor admits that the reason he's an atheist is that when he was a little boy, his mother was dying of cancer. And uh, he thought to himself uh, that he thought the same thing that uh, a lot of Christians think that God is controlling it. Why is God killing my mother with cancer? You know, he loves his mother, of course, and he wants her to live. But he says, why did God kill my mother? And that would have been a good opportunity for the Christian to say God didn't kill your mother. 
but instead he falls back to this idea that, well, God's ways are higher than our ways. But see, I agree with the atheist there. If what he said was, well, if, if that's how God is, I refuse to serve a God like that. He's not worthy of my worship, and I agree with that. A God that goes around killing innocent people is not worthy of, of worship, is not worthy of even friendship. You know, even, you know, the, the Christian in, that, in the story says, well, uh, God's ways are higher than our ways. Well, if you're going to say that God's going around uh, killing folks, his, that, and his ways are not higher, his ways are lower than our ways, because we wouldn't do that. Even we, as fallible, you know, carnal to a certain extent human beings, uh, wouldn't go around killing innocent. We wouldn't kill our own mother with, you know, strangle her. That's what he says. Why did God strangle the life out of my mother? Well, I agree. If that's God, uh, then he, if God did that, I agree. I don't want to have anything to do with him either. If God's causing earthquakes and tornadoes, if God sent a tornado to wipe out the city of Moore, you know, was that last year that that happened? People attribute that to God. Uh, when there's earthquakes, pe people, you know, because the assumption is that God controls everything that happens. And on the flip side of it, an atheist would say, well, uh, if God controls everything that happens, uh, then how can you say God is good? Well, it's a good point. And I think that's a good logical point. If God controls everything that happens, then you can't say God is good because you can look around and see a lot of things that are bad. Well, I've had this conversation many times with, see that, that position though is the position I think of mainstream Christianity. That's why, that's what I'm saying. I don't agree with that. I've had this conversation with people uh, who say, well, then God's got a different definition of good than we do. But Jesus didn't think so. He said, if, if a son asks his father for bread, will he give him a rock? And if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? And then his conclusion is, if you then being carnal or evil, as the King James says, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more not how much less, but how much more does God know how to give good things to his children? See, Jesus said he's got the same standard you do, only more so. See, if you're good, if you know how to be good, that's what Jesus' point was. God's even more good than you are, if that's the right grammar. He's even gooder than you are. <laughs> if you know how to be good, and we do, don't we? Yeah. He says God's even more good. If, if you use yourself as an example, he's more good than you are. Uh, if you look with me just for a moment in James uh, chapter 1. Here, it, James sums it up pretty well. And Alex, uh, James chapter 1, verse 16. James chapter 1, verse 16 says this, uh, do, not, do not err, my beloved brethren. That means don't make an error. That's what it means. Do not err means uh, don't make a mistake. In other words, what he's about to say, he says, he prefaces by saying, be careful here, don't make a mistake. You know, when you say that to people, you know, like if you're, speaking of children, if you're telling your kids, you know, go and do something, if, there, if you know there's some pitfall <clears throat> or some potential for a problem or a mistake, you might say, now don't make a mistake here, right? That's what he's saying. In other words, he's warning you of a potential pitfall. He's saying, now don't err, don't make a mistake. And what is it he does not want us to make a mistake about? Verse 17. Here's what he says. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now just think about what he's saying here. Far from saying everything that comes down the road is God, everything that happens in life is God, he specifically says good gifts and perfect gifts. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Now he's being exclusive about that. He's excluding some things because everything is not good. Well, what he's saying is things that are not good do not come from above. He says, now don't make a mistake about it. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. And then he says, it comes down from the Father of lights, comma, and he tells you this to, to reemphasize the point, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, meaning that it's never going to change. It's never different. There's no variation. He's always good. And everything that's good comes down from God. Everything that's perfect comes down from God. Now, the, the modern-day mainstream Christian notion, as, as I think presented in this film, is that everything that happens is God, so we just have to be passive and sort of just accept everything that happens. Well, God's got some mysterious plan. You know, that's what we fall back. God's working out some mysterious plan. Well, it's so mysterious that, that it never does, if it never does make any sense, if, it never, if you never see any... Um, 
reason for it, then, it's, then there's no real purpose for it. And here he says, only good and perfect things come from God. Now, he could have easily said, do not err, my beloved brother. Everything that happens is from God. He didn't say that. You notice the specific wording here. So I want to just look at a, pa a few passages of Scripture and see, if the, uh, see how it lines up. See, the thing about it is, a lot of things that people assume are Christianity, a lot of things that people assume are how God is, may not be necessarily correct according to, according to what's in the book, you know. And I would argue that what a lot of people in the culture at large regard as Christianity is not really Christianity. It's a bunch of religious ideas. Some are good, some are not good, and this is one that's, I think, not good. And I want to explain why it's not good in just a moment. John chapter 9, verse 1. Here's a familiar story. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Oh, by the way, don't, don't think I'm uh, knocking this film. I'm glad they made the film. I'm glad they're doing it. I'm glad for all these films. But, you know, what, I, what worries me a little bit, or what uh, I wouldn't say worries me, but what, what I'm uh, uh, finding fault with is presenting a, an in, uh, uh, a not complete or a, an unhealthy view of what Christianity is, an unhealthy view of uh, what God is like. You know, frankly, just to tell you the truth, when I was growing up uh, and in church, I got a, a lot of that. Uh, and, and it creates a sense of fear. It create, makes God seem severe, somebody to be afraid of, you know, unpredictable. You never quite know. One false step, and he's liable to send a car to run over you, which is what happens in the movie at the end. Oh, I shouldn't I'll get, Spoiler. <laughs> I've got to put spoiler alerts on the uh, YouTube video. <laughs> yeah, he's liable to give you cancer. He's liable to run over you with a car. He's, you know... Um, if you've ever been to revivals, you know, the, the purpose a lot of times is just to scare people into, into accepting Christianity or getting saved or being a convert. And I've heard this story more than once about people, the, this carload of teenagers who left the revival laughing and they got in their car and drove away and they were hit by a train and all killed. Well, that creates this sense that God is like this tyrant up in heaven who is, you cross me, buddy, you better watch out. I'll, I'll send a car wreck or a, or a train or, or a lightning bolt or a or an earthquake, or cancer. I'll get you. I'll show you who's boss. See, I don't think God's like that. I think James said, here's what God is like, beloved brethren. He sends good and perfect gifts for us. Now here in John chapter 9, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which is blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, Master, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now stop right there. And the disciples have this same kind of religious notion that Here's a tragedy. Here's a bad situation. This man's born and blind. Somebody must have sinned, and God's getting him back. Somebody must have sinned, and this is retribution for sin. That's what the assumption is. So they say, who sinned? Somebody must have, or this wouldn't have happened. God evident. See, they're implying that God caused it because somebody sinned. Now, I understand how they might think the man himself might have sinned and got struck blind, or the parents, I guess. No, I guess, the, yeah, what I can understand is the parents, maybe they sin and the child was born blind, but the man was born blind, so what did he do before his birth? Well, that's not very really logical anyway, but verse 3, Jesus said, listen, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Stop right there. He does not mean by that that they are sinless and perfect. What he means is their, their uh, actions had nothing to do with it. In other words, it has nothing to do with this man's sin or his parents. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him, that's a way of saying, don't worry about what, who sinned. Uh, instead, let's talk about the works of God. Now, what that means is the works of God have not yet been made manifest in him. In other words, this is not the work of God. Then he says in verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam which is by interpretation sent, and he went therefore and washed and came again seeing. Now that was the work of God. Jesus said, I've got to work the works of him that sent me, and so he healed this man. He, cur he made it right. He took a bad situation and made it right. And he says, this is the work of God, and I'm going to work the works of God, him, him that sent me, while it's day. Now if he would have had the modern day theology of everything that happens is God's work, he would have said, uh, well, here's a man born blind, who sinned, the disciples say, he or his parents, he would have said, well, we just don't know God's ways are higher than our ways. God's working out some mysterious purpose. 
and he would have left him blind. I, I'm glad Jesus, at least, you know, at least Jesus does not have that idea about things. At least Jesus didn't think God is indifferent to suffering, indifferent to our condition. At least Jesus is showing here, if, you know, even if the modern day church world doesn't want to uh, talk about it, is uncomfortable with it, Jesus here is saying that the work of God is to take bad things and make them right. Take this blindness that this man was born with. Think about what a terrible life that would be if you were born blind and couldn't see anything. It would be horrible. It would be terrible. Uh, and so Jesus uh, made it right. I like what the, of course, I, I like to always read the message translation of this. You know that I like the message, what it says here. Alex, go back to verse 1 and let's just read it and let it go. Uh, verse 1 in the message says this. Alex has got to get it here for us. Walking down the street, Jesus saw a man blind from his birth. Okay, verse 2. His disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents causing him to born, be born blind. Verse 3. Jesus said, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause and effect here. Look instead for what God can do. That's a good answer, isn't it? And we like to do that too. Well, this is because, you know, well, it doesn't matter why it happened. You know, things are happening. We'll talk about uh, maybe what the agency is. It's a lot of possibilities, you know, of what's at work. Okay, then uh, that, that's good enough. We can stop right there. Let's look at another one. You can go back to King James now, Alex. Uh, let's see. Uh, how about Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, starting with verse 35? Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, beginning with verse 35. Mark's Gospel, and I'm saying it over and over again to cover for the fact that I haven't turned there yet. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 35. Here's another little story. On the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent the multitude, sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and they say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? <clears throat> and he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, if he had had the modern-day church traditional Christianity theology that everything that happens is God working out some mysterious purpose, like the scene in the movie where the pastor's car wouldn't start. Uh, you, you, you might have said, if this were the modern day and a storm comes up, you know, you might have said, well, God has got some purpose. He's, God's got some purpose. And maybe he didn't want us to pass to the other side. You know, maybe God wanted to stay where we were. Maybe he wants us to sink in the middle of the lake. We don't know. It's mysterious. You know, God controls everything that happens, so this is God's work. Jesus evidently did not think so because he got up and rebuked the storm. Did you notice that? Verse 39, he rebuked it. Now, I wouldn't think that Jesus would rebuke God. I wouldn't think that, would you? I wouldn't think that he would rebuke the work of God. So evidently, Jesus did not regard every circumstance as God at work. In fact, it seems as though uh, he has the same attitude that James had that good and perfect things are from God, but this storm that's about to sink them in the middle of the lake is not, definitely not good and not perfect. You know, I, I can just imagine somebody saying, well, we're not qualified to know what's good. Yes, we are. We, yes, we are. Something that's going to drown everybody and sink them to the bottom of the lake is not good. Something that causes pain and, 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 and hurt is not good. You know, I've, uh, and again, I don't mean to be pointed about it, but uh, I've talked to Christians, right here in this very town of Alba, not far away, not somebody living far off somewhere, face to face uh, with some life-threatening disease, uh, debilitating disease. Well, God gave me this because he knew I needed it. It'd make me closer to him. No, James says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Now, you know, uh, a, a person might say, well, what did I do to deserve it? We think that way a lot of times when something bad happens assuming that there's some connection, like the disciples did. No, there's, Jesus said, don't make that assumption. Don't look for blame. You know, what he's basically saying back there in that other story was, let's just, 
instead of trying to figure out why a bad thing happened, let's just see how God can make it right. Yeah, that's what God's all about. So Jesus rebuked the wind and the storm, and it stopped. So evidently, uh, the wind and the storm were not God at all. In fact, what, what God was in was the settling of it down uh, and, and bringing calm back into the situation. Here's another similar uh, story. This is in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 38. We're just going to take a little tour of the different Gospels and look at some of these. Luke, chapter 4, verse 38. And uh, here's another little story about Jesus. Luke, chapter 4, verse 38. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. Now, Simon is Peter. That's Peter. His name was actually Simon, and uh, Jesus gave him the name Peter, which means a rock. And he rose and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. Now, if you stop right there, if he had the modern-day theology that's uh, prevalent in the church world, when they came and said, she has a fever, uh, he might have said, well, uh, God must be at work. God's working out some mysterious purpose. Now, you might think that's a little far-fetched, but I've read things like that from different writers at different times, especially Puritan writers back in the 16th century. They believed strongly in this idea of a, a concept, a version of predestination that says God controls everything. So if a person were sick with a fever, well, God is working something out. And he, but he doesn't say that. He also didn't say, well, let's all pray for her. Now, that's okay. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Because we do that. But you know what? If you, this is an interesting thing. This is a very interesting point. Make of it what you will. But Jesus never prayed for anybody for healing in, in the Gospels. He didn't ever pray for healing. He just healed them. He rebuked. Well, that's what he does here. Let's just read it. Verse 39. He stood over her. And I'm not saying, by the way, that we shouldn't. I'm just saying that he didn't. He stood over her, and he rebuked the fever. And it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered to them. So evidently, the fever, that illness... That incapacity was not God. It wasn't that God was working out some mysterious purpose. It was pretty clear cut. It was a bad thing. It was not from God, so Jesus rebuked it, and it went away. Uh, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Now, before, you know, the thing of it is, I think the reason Christians don't act this way is they're not quite sure. But I think we can be sure bad things don't come from God. And a person might say, well, that's Jesus. Right. That is Jesus. And we are his body. We are Christians. I think it would be okay to act like Jesus, don't you? I, I think it would be healthy if we did. Uh, anyway, he stood over her and he rebuked the fever. You know, when you rebuke something, it's like you're castigating it. You're condemning it. You're saying, you know, like a, we might say if, a, if a, a stray dog comes running up to you and trying to bite your leg, you might rebuke the dog. Go away, you pest. You know, that's, that's what we mean by that. He's saying he rebuked the fever, and it uh, immediately left him. So evidently, he did not regard the fever as originating with God. Uh, let's see. Go on reading. Verse 40. Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick, listen to this now, all they that had any sick with divers, that means different, diverse, different diseases, brought them unto him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Did you notice the words, all and every one? That means a crowd came after this, and they brought all different kinds of people with all different kinds of sicknesses and diseases to him. And it says he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Now, you would think that he'd at least go down the line and say, well, you know, uh, pick and choose and say, well, you know, with you, God's working something out. God gave you this to make you more holy, to make you more... Uh, you know, to depend on him more. God gave you this to work out some purpose in his life. No, he didn't regard any of those diseases or sicknesses that way. It said he healed them all. Did I read that right? Yeah, every one of them, and he healed them. Every one means without any exceptions. That means Jesus didn't regard any sickness or any disease as having any value or purpose, God's work at all. He regarded it all as bad, all as uh, something worthy of rebuke or getting rid of. Uh, let's read another one. This is in, um, oh, yeah, uh, this is what I want to read. Let's go back to James just for a second. James chapter 4, verse 7. What's the principle that's at work here? 
James chapter 4, verse 7. Here is the thought. Here is a good principle. James, of course, is the one that said, don't make a mistake. Every good and perfect gift comes down from God. Here he says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. And then he says, listen, resist. Now, that word resist is a lot like the word rebuke. It's, a, it's an action of pushing away. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, you know what's wrong with that, what I'm calling the, uh, this mistaken theology in uh, mainstream Christianity that everything comes from God. You know what's wrong with that? There's no devil in that theology. Do you ever think of that? If everything comes from God, that leaves no role for any enemy of God. And, of course, I've talked to a lot of people. Some people have an extreme position and will say, well, the devil just operates at God's request. He can control. No. The devil is an enemy. He's, he's called the adversary. If he's working for God, then we shouldn't resist him. <laughs> right? Yeah. If he works for God, no, the, I'm serious about that. If he's working, if he's God's agent, then we shouldn't resist him. Resist the devil. So you've got you've to then be able to discern what's God and what's the devil. Well, I think it's pretty easy. I think it's a simple way to discern. Whatever's good is from God. Whatever is bad is from the devil. Or maybe not from the devil. You know, there's other agencies at work. There's human beings at work, too. Yeah. God doesn't control what I do or what you do. And we can do dumb things. We can make, you know, if somebody, uh, let's just say hypothetically, I'm driving down, the, let's just say I'm driving down Flynn Street and somebody doesn't stop at the stop sign and broadsides my car and I'm injured in the car. I wouldn't, I would, I would be wrong to say uh, God caused this accident. No, the, the dummy who didn't stop at the stop sign caused the accident, right? It's a human agency at work. You know, some people think that everything that anybody does, God's like some great uh, chess master moving the pawns around. I don't think he treats us like pawns. And there is something good that came up in, in, the, in the film uh, that the, uh, the Christian representative, the kid who's arguing with the professor, the professor said, well, how do you explain the presence of evil in the world? And he said, because God believes in free will and choice. He gives us, he makes us free moral agents. And that was a good answer. That's the right answer. All of us running around in this world, we have choices to make, and we can make good choices or bad choices. And I've made dumb choices. Everybody, you, you have the potential, you know. And if somebody makes a dumb choice to run through a stop sign and runs into you, you can't blame God for it. And in that case, probably can't blame the devil. They're both standing there going, <laughs> well, don't blame us. You know, it's just hu human beings can cause a lot of problems. But like Jesus said, instead of trying to fix blame, look for what God can do. God can make it right. God can make things right. Now, he says, listen, submit to God, resist the devil. Now, submit and resist are opposites. Would you agree with that? Submit and resist. In other words, submit means agree with and go along with and uh, line up with and, and be submissive to. So we submit to God. So then uh, if you just read that, uh, a person with this sort of uh, prevalent theology might say, well, I submit to everything that happens. No, he says resist the devil. So the devil evidently is, is, a, is a factor. Now I would say that Jesus' attitude about things was uh, all those things that he was rebuking, you know, there's a lot of places where he cast out devils out of people, where he's rebuking things. He, he's saying, I've got to work the works of him that sent me. He's working on the side of God, but he's resisting and rebuking uh, the works of the enemy. You know, a lot of times Jesus would go into the synagogue, and people uh, what, that are described as being, in, being possessed by an evil spirit would cry out and say, we know you, who you are. Uh, we know who you are. You're the son of God. And he would rebuke them and command them to be silent, and they would obey him. Uh, Jesus didn't have any problem with figuring out where the delineation was, where this, who's on which side. But this is what we should do as well. Now, my suggestion is use the Gospels as a good example. Use the Bible as a good example. Jesus rebuked sickness. He was resisting it in that sense. See, I don't think we have any problem with it when it comes down to everyday life. It's amazing to me the same people who will tell me that God gave me this life-threatening disease to teach me something, they'll go to the doctor the next day and try to get rid of it. Now you're laughing because you know I'm telling the truth, right? Now I say, if you really think God gave it to you, then you should stay away from the doctor because then you're resisting God. But see, we don't have any problem with resisting. We know it's bad. That's why we want to get rid of it. 
And see, what I say then is we should resist it with every means available. That's why I don't find fault with going to the doctor, because the doctor's working on the same side God is. I think maybe the doctor, even if he's not a Christian, he's got more sense than a lot of people sit in church, because he knows it's bad. He wants to help you get rid of it. Granted, the doctor is limited. He's just got human means at his disposal. But I think God and the doctor are on the same side. They want to get rid of the things that are bad. So that's part of resisting. We resist it with any means possible. We resist, uh, that's what the suggestion, that's what James is telling us here, resist the devil. That means put your hand and say no. And it's okay to do that. In fact, you should do it. In fact, if you don't do it, <laughs> see, because you have a free will, God's not going to step into your life and just grab you by the scruff of the neck and force you. If he did, he'd force us all to do, you know, I don't know what. <laughs> he'd make us all into Mother Teresa or something. <laughs> no, not necessarily. He doesn't want us all to be Mother Teresa. But you know what I mean. If he, if he was controlling us like puppets, we would all be a lot of saintly puppets dancing around here, you see. So we have a choice, and we can, we, we do, re, we should resist. And we know, we understand this when it comes to just non-religious thought in, this, in the world. We know if we got a headache to take Tylenol or an aspirin or something. We know if we get injured, go to the doctor. We know if we've got a, you know, some kind of a sick, we go and get the medicine necessary. I just say we should apply that same thinking in our religious part of our thinking and just agree with God who's all for healing and all for making things right again. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah. Okay, well, that's all I've got to say today. Let's all stand up.